right, look here. We're getting a couple hundred thousand plus books printed. Been having them come in uh, 25,000 a week. And then they're going out. This is good and evil back here. This is good and evil. See all those? And this is just, uh, we've still got another 25,000 coming in here. And then we've got, uh, had 75,000 printed with a bunch of them going to Africa. And then 200,000 I'm printed that are going around the world that another man is paying for. And so it's saving us a lot of expenses. Uh, we don't, they don't have to be shipped here. They're gonna be shipped somewhere else uh, directly. And so uh, the Lord's blessing us with the ability to get these out to very large numbers of people. Like countries you can't get in, we can send a good and evil in and it stays there and people read it and read it and read it. We get responses from them. People in Arabic and other places are getting saved looking at the good and the evil. So let's go up there and have our third, our third lesson. I can't bend my fingers anymore. All right, let's go. All right, here we are back in the office. Got Adam sitting over here in the corner with the, uh, all the electronic paraphernalia to try to record this correctly. And so we're on our third lesson. This is going to be where it all comes together in this third one. And uh, so I think you'll enjoy this greatly. So here we are. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass in the law till all be fulfilled. Now think about that. Not one jot, a jot or a tittle. A tittle was like, it would look like our apostrophe, not double, but singular, uh, a marker above a word. So he said the Bible, the written text he's talking about, and that's talking about spoken, but written, because he took the jot and the tittle. Not one small is going to pass away until all is fulfilled. Now, when is that? And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So not one little bitty mark will fail in the written word of God till the heaven and earth pass away. And then it'll be preserved in heaven. So think about that. Pick up your Bible that is perfect and read from it. If you don't have one that's perfect, you become the final judge of what it says. So the reason I have been effective, I think, as a Bible student over the years is not because I'm smarter than other people. In fact, I think that a lot of, a lot of teachers and preachers are a whole lot more intelligent than I am. But I believed every word that I read. I never questioned the placement of a word or that it was accurate, or thought there was a better word to go there. All, always knew in my King James Bible that I was reading what God has preserved to this day, perfect and entire. And so because of that, I was able to discern the meaning of it without going to commentaries, which I, I, I read all the commentaries, but to interpret it, I don't need to go to a commentary or to any Greek helps. And I studied Greek in college, and uh, I still refer to it and use it, but only to prove a point to someone who has more faith in men than they do God. All right, let's get into our lesson here. 16 spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What a blessing. Chosen to be without blame, we talked about last time. We also talked about predestinated to be adopted from the foundation of the world god determined to adopt gentiles into a body with jews 
and bring us all into a oneness with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heavenly places. And then we're to be accepted in the beloved. God has a little group, a little family, people that are very close to him that he counts dear, in whom he has faith. Read my book, God Has Faith in You. And we are brought into that group of the beloved. You know, there's not a handful of people in my life that are beloved to me. And then redemption through his blood was the fourth one. Wow. No, no amount of money just took the blood of Christ and made known the mystery of one body to us. That there's one body and we'll all be made one in that body. Now, here's the sixth spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Let's read it. And whom also we've obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we've obtained an inheritance. Now, show me your inheritance. Well, you can't, can you? Because it's in heavenly places, which is, which is what it says about all of these. They're in heavenly places. So... It said we're predestined. This inheritance was predestined. Now, I have drawn up my wife and I will and leaving our, all that we have to just one of the kids. Uh, and uh, the one that feel, we feel like will perpetuate our ministry and, and is capable and able in a position to perpetuate the ministry and uh, keep the family farm for all the other members of the family to utilize uh, freely. And so, but you know, I was talking to the lawyer, and the lawyer said a will is nothing till you die. Your last will and testament is not in force until you die. So even though I have willed an inheritance to one of my kids, it's not theirs. I can change it tomorrow. In fact, I've changed it two or three times over the years. And Deb and I could change it tomorrow. But God has willed something to us, but that will takes place upon his death. Blessing six, predestinated to an inheritance. Inheritance is something of value bequeathed to another upon the death of the testator. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, just as the lawyer told me. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. I think I'll show that to my lawyer. Okay, <laughs> he's not a believer. He wouldn't be aware that that was in there. So Jesus had to die to guarantee my inheritance. That's the only way I can get it. But he has died. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. So I am God's inheritance. And many, many things are my inheritance. Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the wor word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Do you realize you can increase and expand your inheritance? In other words, you can live in such a way, walking after the Spirit, that you lay up treasure in heaven for yourself and expand your inheritance. There will be a judgment seat of Christ in which we'll receive rewards. Some will get no crowns at all. Some will get one. Some will get many, many crowns. So your inheritance is guaranteed, but the degree of it is not guaranteed. That's based on how you live, think, feel, and worship while down here on earth. 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again 
unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. So this inheritance we get from God is incorruptible. Boy, that's good. But anything I carry around with me gets messed up. I can't carry a credit card for very long without it stopping to function. I wear a rub everything off of it with it in my billfold, all the activity I do. Undefiled. I'm so glad I can't defile my inheritance. And that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So it's not going to just kind of dwindle away over a period of time, but it is reserved in heaven, which is where the heavenly blessings are for us, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm glad the God that saves is the God that keeps, because if he didn't keep me, I think there'd be times I would have walked out of the way. All right, blessing number seven, and we've already covered this one, so we won't labor on it, should be to the praise of his glory. Uh, here was the text, Ephesians 1, 11, in whom also we've obtained inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So it says that several times in the book of Ephesians, as well as other places, that the whole purpose, our whole purpose for existence and salvation is to the praise of his glory. You see, we lost the glory when Adam sinned. We're born without the glory. We live without the glory. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God wants to impart that glory back into us, except in a higher degree. So God wants to pass on the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to us. And so this life is about walking in the glory, enjoying the glory, living in the glory, dreaming the glory, and manifesting the glory of God. Wow, I can feel it right now, like waves coming in off the ocean. I can hear it in the music, can you? I can see it in the falling leaves. I look out that window just beyond the camera. The glory. Now, blessing number eight, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Wow, this is getting better all the time. When I look off to the right and up, I'm looking outside at the trees. <laughs> it's much more attractive than the phone. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, that sealing is a guarantee. If you take the word sealed and look at it as it, this is what I do all the time. Look all the way through the Bible every time the word sealed is used. There's not a better way to study the Bible than to do word searches because the Bible uses words consistently from Genesis to Revelation, and it'll use words scores and even hundreds of times, and you'll see a pattern of unfolding of the revelation of the meaning of that word. You see examples of it in the Old Testament. Then you come to the New Testament and you read something like sealed. And boy, your mind goes way back to all those passages in the Bible. We don't have time to go through all of those. And you, you, you can feel what it means to be sealed because you get it directly from the Holy Spirit, from the inspired word. Now, that only works in the King James Bible. They change the word sealed to other words in other translations, even though in the Hebrew it's sealed, in the Greek it's sealed, they think that it, other words fit better, so they'll change it up for you. Sometimes you'll have half as many uh, in one translation as you'll have in the King James Bible where they've used synonyms. So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Spirit of promise. He's called a lot of things. I need to make a list of all the things the Spirit's called. I made a list of the things God has called, and it's over, or Jesus. And there's over 200 things, that 200 names for him. But uh, the Holy Spirit, I haven't done that. The Spirit of promise, a uh, Spirit of mercy, a Spirit of grace, a Spirit of promise, in whom also we trusted after you heard the word of truth. So we trusted after we heard the word of truth. We, <laughs> Calvinists are going to go, <laughs> Calvinists have a problem here. 
the gospel of your salvation, whom also after that you believed. So you had to believe. You had to hear. You had to believe before you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Uh, you've heard of putting down earnest money. When you put down earnest money, that means uh, you, this piece of property is $100,000. I'll give you $1,000 as earnest money to hold it for me until the weekend as other people want to buy. Okay, I'll take it. He takes it because he knows that if I don't show up or if I don't buy that property, he keeps that $1,000. That shows I'm earnest. So God has something to show us that he's very earnest about our salvation. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now, all 16 of these blessings are in heavenly places except one. And that is, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You, let's put it this way. If you were to do a forensic autopsy on your spirit and soul, no, it's not possible, but if you were to do that, if you were to do a forensic analysis of your being, body, soul, and spirit, and say, okay, what has been added? I've got fillings in my teeth. I've got metal in my arm. I've got metal in my chest. I've got metal in my legs. I have been, <laughs> some of you women got silicone. I've, I've had things added to my body. And so if you were to do a forensic analysis, you'll find, some different elements here in my body, but you wouldn't find the inheritance in my body, my soul or my spirit. But there's one thing you'd locate. And that is I have an additional spirit to have two spirits, I have my human spirit and I have additional spirit, which is the Holy spirit dwelling in me. That's the only thing that, that is to me, use the word organically uh, in the spiritual sense that is present, added to my constitution, my nature, that's actually mine right now, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which I sense on a daily, continuous basis, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give, unto you for him hath God the Father sealed. So there is a sealing that takes place for all the promises of God in him are yea and amen unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. That tells you something about the location where you'll discover the presence of the Spirit of God in our hearts. That's, I love you with all my heart. That heart we used as a, as a word to describe the seat of our affections, our emotions. It is what directs us. It is what motivates us. It's what gives us character. It's the heart of a man that God sees. Hearts desperately wicked or the heart is renewed. The heart is full of God or it's full of evil. My heart has the Holy Spirit in it. So he sealed us and we'll discover that spirit in our hearts. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Sealed unto the day of redemption. That seal's not going to go away. It's there until the day of redemption. Now, Paul, this, the text goes on without mentioning any additional inheritances, blessings. So we're going to go ahead and read that text because it's Paul's desire for uh, these Gentile believers, and it r reveals a lot about these spiritual blessings. Okay, this is 15 through the end of this chapter. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, love unto all the saints, he's saying this to the Ephesian Gentile Christians, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So 
Paul is praying that these Christians that he is revealing these spiritual blessings to will have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the spirit would reveal to us, uh, make known to us these truths. It's one thing just to hear me teach them and be able to repeat it, but in your heart to feel it, to know it, uh, is a different matter. Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Because when you really grasp these truths, you grasp God. You have a knowledge, not just to the truth, but as it text says, a knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Think about it. Eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So we're back on the inheritance. So we need to know, he said, I'm praying you'll know what is the hope of this calling. What, that's the content, the volume, the essence of what we're called to in these spiritual blessings. And what is the riches of the glory? Remember, that's one of the spiritual blessings. Riches of the glory. Wow. That means all of the, the, the value, the value in that glory, the, the wealth of, uh, <laughs> of everything. Woo. Yeah. Of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? Mm, boy, this, this is a lot of good stuff here. I mean, you could stop and preach a long time on any one of these points. Exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That's what Paul wants those Gentile Christians to discover, which means you might not <laughs> be there. You might not have that in your heart, that vision, that there's so much more that I can enter into, that you can enter into, if we live long enough, if we grow fast enough. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Notice he wrought this in Christ. There are spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He wrought these things in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him as his own right hand in heavenly places. So this heavenly places is not some spiritual reality. Uh, it's not like a heavenly mindset, or heavenly this or that. It's not an adverb. The heavenly places is an adjective. It's a place, heavenly place. Uh, so it's in Christ far above all principalities. So this thing that fades not away reserved in heaven is above the principalities and powers and mights and dominions, all the devils and angels. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. So there's no personality in the universe and beyond. And there's no dominion, no power anywhere, but that these blessings are reserved in the heavenly place above and beyond all of those things, not to be touched or reached devil can't get to it and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body the church is his body the church is his fingers and eyes and ears and nose first corinthians 11 12 13 14 it's his body which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all and this body fills the universe. So, you know, right now we're a seed and we're going to we're going to be planted in the grave and we're going to come forth to fill the universe in Jesus Christ. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Blessing number 9. Quickened from the dead. This will be different from what you've thought. Uh, maybe not. 
And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's not the new birth. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's how we once walked. That's what happens when you look at pornography. You're walking according to the spirit of the power of darkness, the prince of the power of the air. Among them also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, I like that turn, that twist, but God, in contrast, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. So the quickening that took place is in Christ. It's not in my body yet. The quickening that took place was in Christ. Quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved. Now, if this passage were all we had of the quickened, I would probably think of it like most people think of it. That is talking about me becoming renewed in my spirit and getting born again and getting, an, uh, most people think your spirit died when Adam sinned and so my spirit's made alive with uh, all that nonsense. But here is some other scripture that gives us some light. All you gotta do is look up the word quickened. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, if quickened is the new birth, or getting a spirit you didn't have before, how did Christ get quickened? See, Christ was quickened when he was raised from the dead. At the same time, you were quickened when you were raised from the dead with him. So this quickened is a reference to affixing that which happened in Adam. In Adam, all died, not spiritual death. All died a physical death. So in Christ shall all be made alive. No, we hadn't been made alive yet. We're in Christ, but we will be made alive. First Corinthians 15, when at the resurrection of the body. So this quickened was the resurrection of the dead man. Buried with him in baptism. That's not water baptism. That is the spirit baptizing us into his body. Buried with him in baptisms, wherein also you are risen with him. Now, you never felt that baptism into his body and the res resurrection through the faith of the operation of God. So that's how this took place, through the faith, my faith, in the operation of God. God operated. Who hath raised us, raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. So our quickening had to do with the flesh. And it happened simultaneous with Christ. When I entered, when I was placed into the body of Jesus Christ at my new birth, became a member of his body, then his history became my history. That means that when he lived, I lived. When he obeyed the law, I obeyed the law. When he suffered for sin, I suffered for sin. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he was raised, I was raised. When he was seated, I was seated. When he's the son of God, I'm the son of God. When he's on the throne, I'm the throne. When he feels all things, I feel all things because I'm now in his history. Wow, got that? Here's his history. Here's my history. My history is a history of sin and death. I was taken out of my history, baptized by the Spirit into his. His history becomes my history. 
I become a son of God, live a perfect life, die, buried, raised again, ascended, seated in Christ forever, God's son. That's your salvation. <laughs> Woo, yeah. I want to sing now. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith, the operation of God who raised him the dead, and you being dead in your sins, the uncircumcised decision of your flesh, as he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. When you get into him, the sins are left behind. Now, this is our last two for the day. Blessing 10 and 11, we got them together because they're listed together and they got to be considered together. And they really go with the former one, but they are separate. Uh, raised together, seated together in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6. And it's raised us up together. Now that together is with Christ. And made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. <laughs> Not on the earth. I am not seated with Christ on the earth. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And it's only in him that this is a reality. By faith entering into him, that reality is mine. That in the ages to come. Uh, that's like a dispensation, by the way, for those of you. The ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. I can't dwell on that now, but while the ages roll, an age is separated by a change in dispensation, a change in economy, a change in rule, a change in creation, a new age. And so there's ages coming. Folks, we're not going to just go to heaven and attend church, and that's it. It's over with, you know, forever and ever and ever and ever. There's going to be ages. This is part of an eternal expansion of the universe and God's kingdom. Wow, I wonder what the ages will be like. I don't know, but I'm going to find out, probably sooner than most of you, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. You know, I have been a craftsman and sold things I made and painted and created and so forth, and they are my workmanship. Well, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That was the predestination. We're predestinated unto good works, which God hath before ordained. That's the predestination. Before ordained is a synonym for predestination, that we should walk in them. So he's bringing us back around to that predestination, that all of this God predestined from before eternity past predestined that this is what we should become. Just remember my illustration of the Navy SEAL? Before you attempt to join the Navy SEALs, there is a predestinated end for Navy SEALs. When you join up, you go through a long process of being molded and changed until you reach that predestinated state. And so God has predestinated what a believer should be. And you're in a process right now of being conformed to that image. So you'll graduate one day into his body. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, but that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands, that at the time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's a dismal look at a Gentile. <clears throat> no hope without God in the world. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized, now we're starting a new passage, 
this is going to give you an application of this concept of our being dead, buried, and raised in Christ. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. It's not water. That there's seven baptisms. One of them saves. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. One baptism saves. The other six baptisms are pictures of that one saving baptism. Now, that one saving baptism has to be either water baptism or it has to be spirit baptism into the body of Christ. One of them is a picture, one of them is the reality. Which one is the reality? Which one? <laughs> I rest my case. Wherefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together, that's what you do when you put a body into the grave. You have a child die, you're planting that child when you put him in the ground. You have a saved loved one that dies, you're planting that body in the ground. Because it is going to, the body is going to come forth as a seed does into a glorious plant far beyond the thing that you planted. We've been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If we're in Christ, dead in him, buried in him, we're going to be raised in him. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. You've heard people say, that's my old man made me do that. Now, unless you're talking about your husband, <laughs> your old man didn't make you do that. Because your old man is dead in Christ. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The old man is not some element in you like a sinful nature. The old man is the man you were before you came to Christ. The old man is the Adam man. The old man is the entire person, body, soul, and spirit, mind, emotions that existed before you came to Christ. That's the old man. The new man is the man in Christ, dead, buried, resurrected, so forth. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. So the physical body is the body of sin. So when we died in Christ, buried in Christ, raised in Christ, the body of sin is crucified and destroyed. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. He said, Christians don't serve sin anymore because we have died buried. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So being dead in Christ, we're free. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. In other words, Christ didn't die to stay dead. He died so he'd be resurrected. So we died so we'd be resurrected in the future. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, like Christ's death and freedom from sin. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed. Not figuratively. Dead indeed unto sin, but reckon yourselves to be alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that is the first mention of something for you to do there in the book of Romans. He says, now, now that this is your reality and you're in Christ, reckon it to be true. Now, us folks down south, we've got an advantage over you Yankees because they say, are you going to go to church this Sunday? I reckon so. Are you going to go fishing? I reckon I will. What do we mean by reckon? We mean <laughs> that's our plans. That's our hope. That's our expectation. That's what we're counting on uh, in the Mississippi River, which I used to live on and travel on. They had uh, buoys and bank markers that when you traveled and the river was low to keep from hitting something, you reckoned on those markers. If you lined up these two markers or put this one at a certain degree on your right or your left, whichever the case was, then you reckon on it. 
and as you did, you're able to navigate and pilot your boat down a crooked river with snags and stuff. So uh, reckoning is used by sailors, and that's how they determine their course. So he tells us to reckon. Reckon based on all that he has said here, these spiritual blessings. Reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. When the temptations of sin in this body, see, I'm still in the dead body. I'm dying. I'm still in the dead body. So when the temptations of sin attack the body, and when the lust, natural lust of the body rises up, I have a recourse. I reckon myself to be dead. So how do you do that? I say, I'm feeling the pull of sin. I feel the desires of sin in my body, my mind, my spirit. But God says I'm dead, buried and resurrected in Christ. So I'm going to walk after the spirit here and reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin. And as I move by the Spirit of God, as I move my consciousness into that walk of the Spirit, that power and pull of sin, that the pull of sin, which still in my body, loses its power. And I walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh, and do not fulfill the lust of the flesh because I'm reckoning myself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Now, folks, that's the gospel, the full gospel of not only justification, but sanctification. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It's possible for a Christian to sin not. I have some message called sin no more. Need to get it. Get Romans again, free online. Get it and listen to it. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I can do that because I'm in Christ and he's alive from the dead and I'm alive from the dead in him. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion. If you're a born-again Christian, anger does not have dominion over you. There's no place for you to be angry with your wife and children. If you're a born-again Christian, greed, bitterness, have no dominion over you. If you're a born-again Christian, lust after Others outside your spouse have no dominion over you. You ought to lust after your spouse. That's a lot of fun. But you're not to lust after anyone else. So sin shall not have dominion over you. If you are born again Christian, you have the Spirit of God, then these things are true of you, these, these blessings here, heavenly blessings. They're true of you. And pornography does not have dominion over you. It only, you only yield to it because you choose to, because you love it more than you love God. You love it more than you love righteousness. You love it more than you love truth. You love it more than you love heaven. You love it more than you do your wife and kids because you're sacrificing your children to the inroads of Satan into the family and your kids will end up being pornographic users too. So you have no place. You are free from it. It'll not have dominion over you. Romans 6, 18, being then made free from sin. Three times in the book of Romans, it says you're free from sin, free from sin, free from sin. In chapter 6, being then made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. So that's what we are today, servants of righteousness. So 16 blessings in heavenly places in Christ, accessed by the Spirit given to us so that we'll be one perfect new man in heavenly places. So that's our third. Now the fourth we'll finish up with the last five, is it? Five blessings 
in heavenly places.